Chapter 8 Rao Rao had arrived at the war council late and had been greeted by chaos, shouting, yelling. Lord Mahesh leading and claiming the empress was too overwrought to attend. Rao should have spoken for Malini, had wanted to, but he had met Lord Khalil's eyes, seen the lift of an eloquent eyebrow and the faintest shake of a head, and Rao had kept his calm and his silence even as his frustration grew. Malini had to have a plan. Malini always had plans. He had kept his calm as he saw to his men and made an accounting of the injured and the dead. He had continued to be calm when one of his own Aloran military officials begged to speak to him and told him that Yogesh had been ordered to carry a message for the Empress and was already gone. And yet here he was, in Malini's tent, trying desperately to keep a level head in the face of her quiet amusement as if his worry entertained her. Maybe it did. You sent a message to Ahiranya, Rao pressed on, an imperial missive placed in a military official's hand. You found spies of your own, Rao, she murmured. That's good. My men are just loyal, he said. What did you say? What orders did you send? You don't know. I didn't read your letter. Out of loyalty or because you lack the opportunity? A pause, a breath of silence that he filled by shaking his head and closing his eyes. I thought as much, she said. Oh, she definitely sounded amused. You're not quite the moralistic. If you were, you'd never get anything done, and I'd have no use for you, was unsaid but heavily implied. Though you've grown overly fond of lecturing me. I don't lecture, he said. My job is to advise, and that's exactly what I do when I am actually afforded a chance to do so. Advise me, then. The Ahiranya are still viewed with great suspicion. I am well aware of that, she replied. Then I have to ask why you're reaching out to them, he said, especially now when you have... He paused and said more quietly, After the fires and the war council, you have enough problems to contend with here. How did Mahesh's war council proceed without me? She raised an eyebrow at him. I'm curious. Did anyone outright say that Aditya should have the throne, or did they only imply it? If you want me to be your eyes and ears, then it would be helpful if you could be honest with me in turn, Rao said. It was what was absolutely not an irritated tone of voice. I have spies enough said Malini, and until I am able to attend my own war councils without fear of my own men may seek to protect me from the war I am leading, you will have to forgive me for holding some truths close to the chest. You don't have to lie to me, he thought, and did not say. It sounded too pitiful even in his own head to be spoken. Do not understand what you are to me. Like all royals of Alor, his true name had always been a secret, a prophecy waiting to be spoken. His true name had been the guiding star of his faith and fate, dragging him onward, leading him inevitably to kneel before her in the sun-drenched dirt on a road toward Durawali, where he had revealed it to her and given her the right to the throne. When she is crowned in jasmine, in needle flower, in smoke and in fire, he will kneel before her and name her. He will give her the princess of Padijat her fate. He will say, Name who shall sit upon the throne, princess. Name the flower of empire. Name the head that shall reign beneath a crown of poison. Name the hand that lit the pyre. He will name her thus, and she will know. Didn't she understand that his fate was still tied to her own? That the nameless god had made him like this, and he could not change his nature, his purpose? He had named her empress, and she... She did not trust him. He swallowed back hurt. You can't always assume that people are going to turn on you, that they need to be managed and and manipulated. Rao was turned away from her, knowing his face was still painfully open, that she would see right through him if he allowed her to. You're going to have to trust them. Rao, she said after a moment. He looked at her again. The amusement had drained from her face. What was left was tired and shaken and world-weary. I have trusted all through this war, said Malini. I trusted those men who, when we traveled to Duorali, when we forged new alliances there, when we faced battle after battle, I trusted they would fight and die to see me on the throne. 
I trusted that I would find, not find a knife placed against my throat in my sleep. That is plenty of trust, Rao, and more, any more trust, and I will be making my own noose. I just don't believe that the Ahirani will be as much help as you hope they will be, Rao said. I worry that this error will cost you. We will see, Malini said, voice unreadable. But there's no worth in sending a messenger to stop a messenger. My message will reach Ahiranya, and Ahiranya's temple council will respond, and I will deal with the consequences if and when they turn up at my door. That is all. Rao knew a dismissal when he heard one. He bowed. And Rao? He paused. Next time you put your morals aside, she said. You could have chased after Yogesh, if you tried. I cannot coddle you, I cannot treat you as my friend, and I don't ask for friendship in return. I ask for your cunning and canny advisor. I know you have the capacity to be. Do you understand? Yes, Empress, he choked out. He bowed again and swiftly left the tent before he could yell at her. By the nameless, did she want him to be a traitor? Was that what she wanted? She wants you to be more like her, a voice in his said head said. It was his own but calm, reasonable, devoid of strength of feeling currently coursing through him. She wants you to do everything you're capable of to achieve her ends. Somehow, without meaning to, he did not walk back to his own sleeping tent, did not seek out the military officials who served the Aloran branch of the army, who always had need of him for something, did nothing, in fact, that would make him useful. Instead, his feet led him to Aditya, even in the thick of battle, Aditya's tent was a tranquil pool, a place of peace carved out on the edges of war. It was untouched. The smoke darkness roiling around them barely seemed to brush its edges. One of the guards gave him a nod of respect. Shall I announce you, my lord? Arrange refreshments. No need, said Rao, and entered. Aditya had clearly been praying. There was water basin on the ground before him its surface black and utterly still, as reflective as glass and as dark as night. His head was lowered over it. When he raised it, his eyes were as dark as the water, his expression unfathomable. It took a moment for humanity to return to his face, for his eyes to light up with recognition, and his shoulders to soften, the tension leeching away from them. Rao, he said softly, come in. He was sitting cross-legged on the floor on a mat, in nothing but his plainest blue priestly shawl and dhoti. The tent was dim, unlit, though Rao could see Aditya reaching automatically for an oil lamp, preparing to set it alight. His steady hand struck a spark and lit the cotton wick. Lights illuminated his face, his elegant bones, his dark eyes, his serious brows. Rao relaxed at the sight of him. He could not help it. You look surprised to see me, said Rao. You're not the usual visitor I receive at this hour, said Aditya, but you are most welcome. Besides, the guards usually announce you. Rao shook his head. I told them not to. I wanted it to be just us. I... Rao collapsed. It was a controlled fall as he collapses went. His knees jarring the ground, his breath leaving him. He'd been waiting to break. He wouldn't have another chance. Rao... Aditya said alarmed. He moved to kneel by Rao's side. Aditya's hands clasped Rao's shoulders as he said, Are you well? Breathe with me. Here. A hand pressed to Rao's chest, rising, falling. After a moment, Rao breathed with the motion of it. He felt sick with relief and sick with fear both. There, Aditya murmured. There, breathe with me. You're well. Surely you've smelled the smoke, Rao managed to say. Aditya nodded almost imperceptibly, but Rao caught the gesture. As his face moved, the light painted it. There were deep shadows under his eyes. Has my sister burned the city? Aditya asked. He said it with resignation, as if he expected her to. No, Rao said. No. How could he have even begin to explain? I, he tried. He told Aditya haltingly about what he'd seen during the siege. The men, uneasy, waiting for word as negotiations took place. The sudden sight of swords and arrows wreathed with flame. The fire, the strangeness of it. The attempt against Malini's life. Aditya nodded, expression grave. 
he knew even better than Rao the significance of magical fire. It was a game Chandra and I used to play, you know, Aditya said finally. When we were small boys, we were still training with blunted weapons. The two of us, flinging ourselves into battle with our swords, imagining they were burning with magical fire, that we were mother-blessed. A smile flitted across his face, lit his mouth and eyes, then faded away swiftly as it has come. We were very young then, and I left him soon enough for my own training and my own lessons. I remember, Ralph said. He'd arrived at the Imperial Mahal himself as a boy, been raised alongside Aditya and his companion to foster ties between Alor and Parijat. He remembered how relieved he had been to become Crown Priest Aditya's companion, not Prince Chandra's. Aditya had welcomed him with a smile, had spent days showing him around the Imperial Mahal, and had let Rao borrow his favorite horse, his favorite books. We're going to be friends all our lives, he'd said, when Rao had expressed reluctance to take what was rightfully Aditya's from him. Surely friends should share everything. Chandra had not even looked at him when he arrived, had refused to talk to him or eat with him for months, and curled his lips in disdain at any effort of Rao's part to make friends. Once, during practice battle, under the watching eyes of the sages, Chandra had beaten Rao around the skull with the training saber, one blow so vicious it left him unconscious. He was trapped in a sick room for a week before he recovered. It was only then that Rao learned Chandra disdained him for being a follower of the Nameless. My brother spends too much time with the high priest, Aditya had said absently, fussing with Rao's bandages like a mother. But don't worry, he'll come as he grows older. All the sages tell father so. No matter what anyone says, no matter what my sister may believe, Rao, Chandra is not inherently evil, Aditya said now. There was something raw in his voice, almost an entreaty. He's been misled. He's chosen to walk a terrible path. I left my apparent fate once and embraced another. Maybe Chandra can one day do the same. Aditya's hand was still against his chest, a light, meaningless weight. Rao shifted away from him and the hand lowered. Rao thought of Alori, her hair caught in the wind, her eyes fixed on distant birds, the way her cheeks had dimpled when she smiled. He thought of her and all the anger he had refused to feel rushed through him, alchemized with into grief. He squeezed his eyes shut, holding back tears. He wasn't going to cry. Malini isn't alone in believing he's beyond saving, said Rao, voice tight. He murdered my sister. Alori never had a choice to walk a different path. I don't see why Chandra should be allowed to when he stole that from her. Men do terrible things, Aditya replied that plea again in his voice that does not mean they have no capacity for good our men are burning because of him Rao said they are not my men said aditya they are malini's the burden of that must lie on her just as it lies on chandra and if i look in my heart every day and forgive my sister Rao's, Rao opened his eyes just in time to see the expression of quiet anguish that crossed Aditya's face before it settled into calm once more. Rao, I must my I must forgive my brother too. They could have been Aditya's men. They could have been, if Aditya had not refused his birthright over and over again. If Rao had not kneeled before Malini and prophesied her rise and Aditya's fall. If Aditya had found a way to forgive Malini and Chandra, had he found a way to forgive himself too? Had he forgiven Rao for his part in Malini's rise? Why are you here? Aditya finally asked. With a start, Rao realized he had been silent for some time, staring blankly at Aditya, wanting to do... something. Ring Aditya by the throat, perhaps, or shake him, or hold his face and say, I wish you could be more than this. I wish you would grieve as I grieve, and hate as I hate and be the person you were when you and Prim and I were boys. I wish, I wish. If you've come for comfort, Aditya said, or prayer, then I've failed you utterly, Rao. I'm sorry. There were many things Rao could have said. I came to tell you what happened. I came to ask for your help. I came to tell you that Malini is fighting to make those men obey her, and I fear this will break her control of them and you... Aditya, I don't know why she allows you to live when you're a threat to her, and I hate myself for even thinking it, but as long as you're here... 
a tumult of thought, too much and none of it useful. He had told a truth instead, if not the truth. I came to see you, Rao said, because you're my friend, and I needed to see that you are well. And now I have. I'm unchanged, Aditya said gently, as always. Low murmurs sounded beyond the tent. This time a guard peered in, announcing the presence of a military official who entered and bowed low. Prince Aditya, Prince Rao. He lifted his head and said, Prince Aditya, Lord Mahesh has requested your presence. For what purpose? Aditya asked. The official's gaze darted to Rao, then away. He and a few lords from Pajajat wish to speak with you. They earnestly hope you will attend them. Another meeting that Malini had not been invited to. Rao would have to make sure she heard of it, if one of the attending officials had not already passed the information to Lata. Aditya shook his head. I have meditation to engage in, he said as if it, this were a far more vital task. Prince Aditya, please, the official said, pleading. What must I tell them? Lord Mahesh will know my reasoning, Aditya said calmly. We have spoken of it often enough. My prince, please. I will come if my sister summons me, Aditya said. There was new iron under the mildness of his voice. Has she? Rao considered him carefully. There was a sharpness to Aditya's gaze. The empress will not be present, the official said reluctantly. Ah, it grows late, Rao said, clicking his tongue. Who knows where the empress has got to? She's a busy woman, isn't she? No matter. He rose to his feet. Do tell Lord Mahesh I can find her for him. The, the, there's no need, my lord, the official stammered. No, no, it's no trouble, Rao said, smiling. As Prince Aditya has said, he cannot accompany you. You should go and give Lord Mahesh his apologies. The official did not protest, but he left radiating anxiety and disapproval. Rao turned to Aditya. I wish I could have stayed longer, he said frankly. Through all his frustrations with Aditya, and yes, his anger... That was entirely true. But his he had responsibilities, and unlike Aditya, he couldn't run from them. Rao turned to the entrance. Rao, said Aditya. Rao's thoughts careened to a halt. Yes? I would like to, you to assess my guards, he said. You have my permission to make changes to the roster. A few of your men would be ideal. Despite Aditya's enforced peace, the world kept on creeping in, in smoke, and fire, in men. Not all visitors are welcome as you are, Aditya said. I'll arrange my own men, Rao said carefully. And next time, Aditya? Yes? I'll bring you some wine, he said, keeping his voice light. This was his friend. Never mind anything else. That remained true. Aditya nodded once in graceful thanks, and Rao left him behind.